This video is brought to you by Remote HQ, the platform that allows teams to work together as if they were in the same room. Hello guys and welcome back to a somewhat unfair comparison. With Apple switching to new ARM-based processors, I thought it would be interesting to compare the new M1 MacBook Air to the original 2008 13-inch MacBook Air. A lot has definitely changed in 12 years, but exactly how much has changed? Anyway, let's take a look. Ah, the original 2008 MacBook Air, the world's first 13-inch notebook that could fit inside a manila envelope. I was honestly obsessed with these as a 12-year-old child, but the price definitely kept it out of my hands. With an SSD and the 1.8 GHz processor, one of these could cost you well over 4,000 Australian dollars. When Apple introduced the original MacBook Air, they were entering uncharted territory, the ultra-portable market. By 2008 standards, it was definitely an ultra-portable. With any product, it takes a few generations for them to mature and have all the quirks ironed out. I would actually recommend against buying a first-generation Air unless you want it for the collectability. Here are some of the quirks that plagued the first-generation MacBook Air. The hinges are notoriously weak, the port selection was very limited and annoyingly under this little flap. The mechanical ZIF drives were also painfully slow and capacities were lower than what you'd find in other MacBooks of the time. The original MacBook Air uses tapered edges so that it looks slimmer than it actually is. What I mean is, from certain angles, it does look very thin. You would have seen these angles in the original promotional material, and when in reality it's not that thin, especially on its thickest edge. The low-powered Core 2 Duo CPUs were also painfully slow. The soldered-in RAM was capped at 2GB, fine for 2008, but this crippled the longevity. In saying that, Apple actually did sell an educational model with 2GB of RAM up until 2012. Those definitely aged like sour milk. But has the latest Apple M1 MacBook Air fixed and improved on everything the 2008 model started? Well, let's start off by looking inside. This is honestly the first time I've been nervous about opening up a laptop. To get inside one of these new M1 MacBooks, you'll need a five-sided pentaloop screwdriver, which are thankfully easy to find online. Then it's simply a matter of popping off the back lid. Before we take things further, I'd like to thank Remote HQ for sponsoring this video. If you're looking to collaborate with co-workers and work together in real time across various applications, you should definitely try out Remote HQ. From conferencing to brainstorming sessions, this virtual office space allows you to work remotely and securely all from your web browser, no download required. Once you've signed up, you can invite your friends and co-workers to use Remote HQ. From the main page, you can create both private and team rooms for limitless collaboration possibilities. I found the real-time audio transcription to be pretty useful, and the fact anyone can edit documents and web pages at the same time is pretty neat. There are honestly so many different uses for Remote HQ, and there's an ever-growing list of compatible web apps. The customizable workspace allows you to set up everything just the way you want it so you can get your work done easily and efficiently. Remote HQ also offers automatic session capture so you'll never lose track of files and notes ever again. If you want to find out more, head over to remotehq.co forward slash pcivrai for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, feel free to use my code pcivrai for three months free. With the M1 MacBook Air open, what really grabs my attention is just how tightly integrated the components are. This is also the first time I've seen what looks to be a QR code etched right into the chassis of the laptop. But how does it compare to the first generation model? This one having the case held on with more conventional Phillips head screws. Immediately it's very clear that there's a lot of unused space inside. This was also something I noticed with the first generation iPad. Of course, Apple over the next decade revised the design to cram more into a smaller device. While the original MacBook Air uses a fan, to a very limited effect I must add, the M1 processor is cooled passively with no need for a fan or any air vents for that matter. When it comes to heat output, the M1 processor stays very cool even under full load. The same cannot be said about the underpowered P7700 Core 2 Duo that's found in the original MacBook Air. When I redid the thermal paste last year, I got a real look at how terrible the heatsink design really was. The fan is basically pointless and simply blows air in the direction of the processor. The whole heatsink is literally a thin piece of metal that doesn't dissipate heat well at all. Something it does, however, do better than the M1 MacBook is have removable storage. Sadly, it's using a very small 1.8-inch SIF drive, making an upgrade possible, but also very expensive. 
The drive form factor was used to save space, and solid state storage wouldn't be a standard feature until 2010. With the newest Apple devices, the storage is soldered directly to the logic board, making it not possible to upgrade, and in the event of inevitable drive failure, renders the laptop mm, essentially useless. RAM is also soldered directly to the logic board in both machines, so to future-proof I'd strongly suggest getting the 16GB M1 model to help future-proof it. Another point against the M1 Mac is the fact that the battery is glued in place, making replacements quite a bit more challenging. The battery in the original Air can easily be taken out with just a few simple screws. One area the original Air does fall short in however is sound quality. Inside is a single speaker chamber producing a mono sound through the keyboard. It's tinny, very little bass and not very loud. The M1 MacBook on the other hand, oh boy, produces phenomenal sound through its stereo speakers. The large chambers port the sound through dedicated speaker grills creating what I feel is some of the best sounding audio from a small laptop. Stereo separation and volume are also excellent, truly a great multimedia experience. Now that we've touched on the internals, let's take a close look at the aesthetics and usability of both laptops. Apple has usually been pretty decent when it comes to trackpads, both the M1 Air and the original are no exception. The Force Touch trackpad on the M1 uses what are essentially magnets and coiled wires to simulate trackpad presses, meaning the glass surface doesn't actually move at all. This saves space by removing the need for a physical mechanism that would move downward slightly with each press. The original MacBook Air trackpad is fine, but it really doesn't compare to the larger Force Touch trackpad on the M1 Air. But something they come very close in is the keyboard and typing experience. After a few years of unreliable and honestly pretty lacking butterfly key switches, Apple finally moved back to a more traditional scissor switch mechanism with the humbly dubbed Magic Keyboard. Both keyboards have a decent amount of travel, but due to the M1 not being used for 10 years, feels a bit more clicky which I prefer. Overall the key layouts are nearly identical, and I think you'd enjoy typing on either of these devices. When it comes to the display bezels, there are actually people complaining that they're big on the M1 MacBooks. Yes, they aren't razor thin, but they are noticeably smaller compared to the original Air. In fact, for laptops sharing the same screen size, the overall dimensions are somewhat smaller, without sacrificing usability or functionality. That is of course if you exclude the MagSafe charging connector that the original MacBook Air has. If your power cord gets yanked off of the desk, there's a good chance your laptop won't be following it. The same can't be said for the USB-C connector that powers the M1 MacBook. Aside from the headphone jack, these are the only two connectors on here. They can both be used for power, super fast external storage or even act as a display output. Editing a video at 4K using Adobe Premiere, an application being translated through Rosetta 2, not running natively, performed incredibly well even with the limited amount of RAM. This has a lot to do with the unified memory caching to the SSD, but solid state drives do have a lifespan and since they're not replaceable in the latest MacBooks, it made a lot of sense to edit videos off of an external drive. Something I do wish the latest MacBooks had was a standby light. Otherwise you've got to open the lid to find out whether you left it on, which actually automatically turns on the machine anyway. When it comes to the displays, the clear winner is the M1 MacBook Air. It is by far one of the best quality displays you can get on a laptop, and as far as brightness is concerned, the original 2008 Air isn't horrible, reaching just over 320 nits but falling short in terms of sRGB and Adobe RGB color space coverage. One downside the M1 machines have is the fact that calibration software I use doesn't actually detect the display, but these issues will go away when developers update their software. It's great to see that the software still works on an old 10.7 Lion version of macOS. Using Rosetta 2, running x86 based applications has been a very smooth experience. I simply can't wait to see the performance gains once all of my favourite applications are running natively on Apple Silicon hardware. Running Minecraft, specifically version 1.10.2, that's the newest version that'll run on the original MacBook Air, really shows just how well the new M1 chip performs. With frame rates well above 120, running through Rosetta, the new MacBook Air is quite impressive. The original MacBook Air struggled to display over 8 frames per second. The number of games that'll run on both machines is pretty low, and thankfully old school RuneScape does run on both laptops. The frame rate is very low on the original MacBook, which can't be said about the buttery smooth performance on the M1 Mac. You could technically play old school RuneScope on either machine, but I think I know which one I'd prefer to use. When it came to benchmarking, it was also hard to find applications that would work in both 10.7 Lion and 10.16 Big Sur. 
Even though the x86 based Cinebench R15 was being translated through Rosetta, the M1 Air scored an impressive 992 against a score of just 31. I thought I'd also try the Geekbench 5 benchmark, and the M1 MacBook Air performed exceptionally well. It even outpaced my Dell G7 6 core 12 thread i7 gaming laptop. All the quirks of a first generation product have well and truly been ironed out over the last 12 years. The fact that this is Apple's cheapest and lowest end laptop going into 2021 says a lot about the new direction they're taking. The ARM based Macs that are going to be coming out soon are sure to be game changing, but it seems like user upgradeability and repairability are becoming a thing of the past, which is a shame. It's crazy to see just how far the MacBook Air has come, from an overpriced and underpowered laptop to a honestly very compelling budget laptop with a great screen and excellent performance. The new M1 processors are truly as great as everyone's saying. A nearly doubling in battery life and so much more performance per watt is truly excellent. Anyway, Christmas is coming up soon. I hope you've enjoyed the video and have a Merry Christmas. Hopefully I'll get one more video out before the end of the year. I'll see you next time. Take it easy.